For those who do not know Betty Brennan, she lives happily with her husband Joe in Fort Jarvis, New York. About 18 years ago, it became clear that God had raised up Betty Brennan for a spiritual ministry of discernment of spirits. She is also used in the ministry of teaching. She nearly or most surely has a full-time position teaching for one of the New York diocese. Betty brings to us a clear, spiritual, authoritative teaching style. She is very much in demand all over the country to lead retreats, conferences, and seminars. Her ministry is one which is best experienced and not read about. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought to us our sister, Betty Brill. Thank you. Before I start, I was just wondering if my daughter Maureen was here. I think I'd like to share a little bit of my background so you know where I'm coming from. Up until 18 years ago, I guess you would classify me as a true persecutor of the church. I was heavily involved in Satanism. I was in one of the upper, upper echelon, and I did much to persecute the church, especially the Roman Catholic Church. I was born a Catholic, I was raised a Catholic, I went to Catholic schools all my life. My dad died when I was about 12 years old, and my mother, unable to handle the pain and wanting to raise her children as good Catholics, decided to send both my brother and myself back to Europe. And so back I went and was raised in the isolation of a convent boarding school, which was very, very painful to the average American kid from Brooklyn now in this type of a surrounding. So I faced a lot of loneliness, but I also found Christ. When I graduated and went on to school and came back to this country, I guess I was what you would call a good Catholic. I went to Mass on Sundays. Sort of knew my theology, didn't have too many questions, wasn't too involved. But then I had a child that was born with a terminal disease, brain disease, and I watched that child die slowly for two years in front of me. I had to learn how to tube feed her, milk her bladder, move her bowels, and everything else, suction her that goes along with that. And something within me died. And I had this tremendous, tremendous anger at God. And I went through all the things that we're supposed to go through. I went, we had a mass said for her. And I remember when the funeral was over, going back into the church by myself, looking up at the crucifix and saying, I'll get even. And then I let it be. And I went back, I'm a cellist, to playing the cello, and I joined an orchestra. And what I didn't realize is that in the orchestra that I played in, there were four or five different satanic priests. I ended up, or ended up, that one of them really befriended me, an older man, who made a point of every evening that we had practice to inviting me out for coffee and allowing me to share the brokenness of my life. I didn't know that as well as it, that being a satanic priest, he was also a psychologist. So I was receiving, little by little every week, negative inner healing. And I transferred on to him, and I sort of needed him, because he was the only one that allowed me to express my hatred and anger and frustration at God without saying, you shouldn't feel that way, or anything else. So I felt I was allowed to be, and I needed him. So one night, we played somewhere, and my children were away, and my husband was away on a trip. And we're at a party, 
played in this place, and they were going to a party, and I had 72 hours free. So being the party girl, I asked where they were going, and they said they were going to a party, and I insisted on going. And he said, no, no, I don't think you're going to like this party. Give him his due. But I insisted on going anyway. And we went someplace, and I thought it was rather peculiar. It was a finished barn. And I thought it was strange when I walked in there, but I said nothing. So he said, listen, we're having a private meeting inside, and I'd like you just to stay out here and, you know, read some books and listen to some music and do whatever you want to do. And you might hear some singing and stuff, but pay no attention to it. Just stay here. So I sat there, and, of course, I heard the chanting and everything was going on. I became very, very curious. Of course, I opened the door, and I realized what was going on. And I couldn't move, you see, because I felt I needed this person. And if I walked out, I knew I would no longer have this person in my life. And that's how I got involved. And there's very little outside of human sacrifice that I was not basically involved in. Very, very little. So when I hear of all the stuff that's going on, I know the power, I know what they have out there. But I'm not going to dwell on that. What I want you to know is that the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life. What happened was I was teaching in a school, substituting, and this other teacher was kind enough to give me a lift every day because we had only one car at the time. And then finally when we got the second car, her car broke down. So one night she calls my house and she says to me, you know, I said, yeah. She said, I'd like to go to Newburgh to a healing mass. And I said, a healing mass? And she didn't know. Nobody knew what I was involved in. And I said, well, I really can't do that. I said, you know, really? We'll call her Pat. I live a hundred and something miles away from that. I don't think my husband would appreciate me. Why don't you go to church wherever you feel you have to go to church? Why do you have to go there? So I came in and I said to my husband, you know what? Pat wants me to drive her a hundred miles to a healing mass. And I was waiting for the reaction from him, and he said, well, why don't you? I said, oh, why don't I? So I said, oh, well, it's really a long story. And he said, well, I think you should reciprocate her kindness to you and drive her to the healing mass. So I said, all right, I'll drive her to the healing mass. So I picked her up, and I drove her to the mass, and I'm sitting outside the church, and I said to myself, wouldn't it be fun to go in there and have a little game play? Of course, I went in with endowments and stuff, the lights went off. The father was stuck in the middle of Mass with no lights. They overcame that, and they had candles. And I tried to do the next thing, and he overcame that. So it drove me nuts, no matter what I did. So finally, at the end of the Mass, I kind of left. I left before the consecration went outside. So it ended up that I had to take her back and forth to this place two or three times. So one day she said to me, you know, I go other times to this place. And nothing happens, only when you're here. And I said, really, Pat? And she said, yeah. And you act very strange. I said, I do not. She said, yeah, you do. I said, how do I look strange? She said, you become terrified. You break out into a sweat. I think maybe I should be rushing for an ambulance. And you take off. And did you ever notice you stay at Mass for the beginning, and then you take off? (coughs) She said, do you go to Mass on Sunday? Of course, I said yes, because you see, what I would do at home is I would pretend that I had to get the children out and my husband out and everybody, and then I'd run down somewhere and get a bulletin from somebody and come back up and I'd been to Mass somewhere, see, and I would just, I played the whole game. And it didn't really show, because basically you're in upper echelon, that's the deceit. It really doesn't show. It's only the people that are in lower echelon that are on the drugs and the alcohol and have all the other problems that people look at, but it's the guys that are really behind the scene calling the shots that nobody seems to go after in the fourth, fifth, and sixth echelon, which are basically the people of society, your doctors, your lawyers, your physicians, your your psychologists. These are the people that are shooting and calling the shots. So to make a long story short, that was my life. Then one day, I decided I had to take her on a Sunday. It was the last time. And I stayed until again before the consecration of the Mass, and I said to myself, I've got to get out of here fast. And I ran out of the building, and as I was running out of the building and down the stairs, this Father Richard McAleer was coming up the stairs, and I really knocked him over, and he fell down three stairs, and he was furious with me. So he ran after me, and almost, literally, he was going to kill me, pinned me to the 
thing and asked me, did I not see him coming up the stairs? And he heard himself in the whole bit, and I went through it. But he realized there was something else going on, because I broke out into this sweat, and he says to me, who are you? In the name of Jesus. And before you knew it, all this stuff came out, and the man wouldn't let go. And I meant I went from torment to torment, struggling and fighting. But he stuck by me. He was a very, very good man, and we work now as a team. The Lord has called us as a team. We go around the world doing official exorcisms and whatever else the Lord calls us to. But I just want you to know that this is where I've come from. And this is who I've been. Absolutely the lowest of the low. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going to raise her up. Because even though she ran away from me, she is my creation. I love her. She is precious. And she's mine. So I just had to make one slight movement towards him. And he came surging in. It wasn't an overnight conversion. The deliverance took almost a year and a half. It was going up to Eucharist, receiving Eucharist, sitting with Eucharist for 15 minutes and running outside a church quietly and losing the whole contents of my stomach. It was superior at the time became fearful and decided the only way that they would give me deliverance prayer is if I came on a Thursday afternoon and publicly came up for it. And the humility of that. One day my husband came to Mass, and he was waiting because he knew I was getting prayed over. And the woman, and he went to move into another pew, and the woman beside him said, Oh, don't leave now. Wait till you see what happens. Wait till you see this woman that comes. Because I would levitate. I would lift up people. Whatever the story was, I don't really remember it too much anymore. And the woman said, I wonder what kind of a person she is. And my husband looks at her and said, she's a very fine person, and I love her, and she's my wife. And they quite didn't know how to handle that. So the deliverance went on. And as the deliverance went on, and I became freer, I began to see the truth and realize that it wasn't Jesus that I was really angry with, but I was dealing with the brokenness within my own heart and spirit, and that had to be healed. I had to learn that I had to look at myself and be responsible for my own actions. I had to look at myself and realize that truth is truth, and regardless of the pain, I'm going to have to make choices. Maybe they're not choices that are going to fulfill me, but they're choices that are eventually going to bring me into the kingdom of God. I realized the value of life. I realized the value of my soul. I realized the value of the individual soul. I understood the meaning of the broken body of Christ. I understood what it was to call the sinner, but to truly love them. To call the sinner in their sin, to state it, have them claim it, put it aside, and reach out to the brokenness and the need within them that caused this sin. You see, it wasn't that I came from a horrendous, horrible background and got involved in this, I came from a very good background because that I didn't have someone, Christian, to really love that would force me to open up, I moved away. I'm not blaming it on anyone. I'm just saying it myself, you see. That's why it's so important. But in this movement and what I was into... What I realized within that circle that really totally blew my mind, for the lack of a better word, was that these people knew the value of the sacraments. That 
impressed me. Every satanic ritual in higher echelon is a takeoff of the sacramental rite that's used within the Roman Catholic Church. And that is a powerful testimony because they know and they understand and they're terrified of the power within sacramental church. Can you hear that? And when the Lord basically took me out of this and made a new creation, and you realize he chooses the weak so that no flesh may glory. So when somebody says to me it's good, or this is good, or you have a great gift, it's just a gift. I know who I am, and I know my sin. And I know my God and my Lord. And even though it's wonderful to hear that on a human level, it's more important that I stay in union with him. It's more important that I just look at a gift that is just a gift. It's more important that I immerse myself in church. It's more important that if I'm going to basically be called out into circles like this, to leave them not with a tremendous up, not with a lot of talking about gifts, but to leave them with a knowledge and an understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ left them seven weapons to deal with the demonic. And that, my brother and sister, they are the seven sacraments of the church. Many times within renewal, I said so in there, it somewhat breaks my heart when I see people constantly, constantly running to conferences on forgiving, constantly buying tapes on forgiving, constantly being prayed over for forgiving, and yet never seek the sacrament of reconciliation. The sacrament of reconciliation, where the Almighty himself comes down and makes you a new creation so that you can go forth and be. The sacrament of reconciliation that gives you the grace to forgive yourself so you leave the guilt behind and you go away strengthened in who you are that you truly are a witness with head raised up because he who is has forgotten that he has even forgiven you. And yet... And yet, my brothers and sisters, we do not frequent that sacrament, do we? We don't even teach it in the Life and the Spirit Seminar. And it's a main tool against Satan. It's a main tool. Because Satan knows that when you go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation, you have stepped into the Kingdom of Light, a light that was given by the Almighty Father, and he can't touch you. He doesn't care if you go to many tapes and listen. If you don't go to the sacrament, he doesn't care. And then the biggest one of all, do you realize, my brothers and sisters, the Eucharist? If we had a bona fide witch here, and we had 2,000 hosts, and only one consecrated, if it was a bona fide witch, they would know immediately, out of that 2,000 hosts, which one was consecrated. And yet... How many of us go to daily Eucharist? How many? How many of you realize that the Eucharist is not symbolic, but it is truly the body, blood, and soul, and divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of you realize that for 15 minutes at least, when you receive the Eucharist, you have within you, flowing through your veins, the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't need another minister at that point. 
The blood of Jesus Christ is now mixing with your blood, and it's one. Just say, Lord, as you flow through me, touch the brokenness, the physical ailment within me. Heal me. Lord, as your blood flows through my veins, cleanse my family line from any hex, curse, and spell. And my brothers and sisters in Jesus, it's that simple. But the emphasis within the renewal, and it's a renewal to renew, is on ministry. And that has its place. But you don't need to be prayed for deliverance for five hours when you can go to the sacrament of reconciliation and the Eucharist and be free. Don't place your strength and focus on men. But go to the sacraments. That's where it's at. That's where the forgiveness. That's where the healing. That's where the touch, the moment of touch, when Christ himself becomes one with you. The moment of silence. What else do you need? Jesus Lord? Jesus is Lord. And now the sacrament of marriage. Sacramental grace. Talking to people in the renewal throughout the country. I'm amazed that people do not know what grace is. And yet, there's very few Satan worshippers that do not know what grace is. I struggle with that. I'm not correcting, it's just my pain and how much as we as leaders have not given. We have actual grace, sanctifying grace, sacramental grace. And this is what's given to us when we call out and ask for it. And yet, I would go as far as saying that 80% of the people in the renewal do not know what it is. Isn't that sad? And yet, we're going to go out and fight Satan? When Satan knows already, and they know who we are, but we don't know who we are? I'm not putting down, but I'm really challenging you. You don't go forth into battle unless you're equipped with the best equipment you can be equipped with. Am I right or wrong? So you don't go out without the sacraments behind you, do you? No. There's nothing there to fall back on. And people say, I go out. But you can go out with the word of God. But if you truly knew the word of God, it would bring you to the word in flesh, wouldn't it? Because the word of God, which is beautiful, leads us to the word in flesh, which is Eucharist. We are called, my brothers and sisters in Christ, not so much to have extraordinary gifts, but to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. You know what it's like when I sit sometimes at Mass and I watch people at a healing Mass going up to Eucharist and they're receiving the author, the giver of life, their healer, their brother, their Lord, and they walk right by it because they're waiting to get prayed over by Betty Brennan or Father McAleer. I was in the cathedral once and I watched this happening and I looked at the Lord and I said, forgive them. But they know not what they do. And I stood up and I said, I'm really sorry. But I have come from the pits. And I cannot allow you to make me a Messiah. I will not lay hands on you or pray with you because you have not allowed yourself to receive nor have you recognized Jesus Christ. And therefore, you're not making an idol out of me. That was a hard word to say, and I really shook when I said it. But do we not do that, all of us? I'm not saying that being prayed over a ministry by people with gifts is wrong. I want you to hear that. But you have to put it in its right order. If you go to a healing mass, 
The moment of healing is when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you come up later, the person just gives you the touch. But the healing has already taken place. So what I'm saying is, you see, when we don't know this, we're always looking for a healing mass. So what happens is, again, even though we're in the renewal, we do not see the Spirit within the sacrament. So we don't put an ordinary, what we would call, because it's the same as a healing mass. But it is, isn't it? It is. Every Eucharist is a healing Eucharist. So if you're hurting, you don't have to wait for the next healing mass. Pick yourself up and go to your local church. And don't tell me the priest is not spirit-filled. Please. My answer to that is, put your hand over the bread and wine and see what happens. Don't you tell me, because he's not emotionally manifesting something, that he is not spirit-filled. That's judgment. And the Lord says what? Judge not. And yet we judge. Who are you to say who's spirit-filled? Who are you to say that? I'm going to ask yourself some questions because I was told to challenge today. Okay? (laughs) Is Jesus your Lord? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know the Ten Commandments? Do you know the precepts of the Roman Catholic Church? Do you know the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church? Ah. Ah. The magisterium is the teaching body of the Roman Catholic Church. All that's taught from that is approved. That's the best way to put it. And you have to know that because it's a very strange age. And you have to know what the teachings of the church so that if one of the shepherds go astray, you can challenge them. If you don't know it, you'll just go astray with them. I'm not going to say we have bad shepherds. We might have uninformed shepherds or shepherds basically at times that are broken. So they're going to tell you what you want to hear rather than what the value system is because it's too heavy and they have a need to be liked and loved like all of us. I'm in no way attacking priesthood. I want you to have that clear. I'm talking to anybody that's in a leading position. Be very careful, the Lord Jesus Christ says to you in Scripture, under who you place your headship. Place yourself under for headship. So now, we're going to learn, right, by this time next year, what magisterium of the church is, what the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church are, where they came from, so that we can go out there and go forth and be truly witnesses. Right. Right. Okay. Do we all know the seven sacraments? Let's take the sacrament of reconciliation. Do you all know what the firm purpose of amendment is? How many? Raise your hand. About 15. Yet you're telling me you're Roman Catholic. Are you not? I'm not, I hope you know, I I ask forgiveness, it's not put down, okay? But I'm really trying to challenge you. I'm challenging you to go forth, but you can't go forth unless you are who you are. And if you don't know the Ten Commandments and the value system, if you don't know the precepts of the church, and if you don't know the infallibility of the papacy, then you're not Roman Catholic. You're not practicing to the best of your ability. Wake up! I don't want to say you're not Roman Catholic. That was a little strong. All right. <laughs> but really, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to find, fight Satan. But Satan's there laughing. He says, hey, buddy, you have a machine gun. You don't even know what kind of ammunition goes in it. Who are you kidding? You're going to fight me. He sits back and he laughs. Isn't it sad? Yet, yet, we'll go to teachings, and I give them throughout the world, different types of spirits, how to do deliverance, how to do exorcism. We wouldn't have to do as much as we're called to do at the Roman Catholic Church. And you and I 
my brothers and sisters, Father Church, would really embrace what the Lord Jesus Christ gave us 